No, I don't think he doesn't fit into me at all. Okay, but all right. I, I know he's a he's a legitimate hero for you. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it's not just that. I mean, like, uh, uh, I mean, Apocalypse Now was a major s success. That was a uh, smash. But it, I know it was. But at the same time, it was a film that had a huge. I mean, all you got to do is watch his wife's oh, documentary yeah, about it to know the emotional toll it took. I know, but the film went on and made a hundred million dollars. I mean, uh, it but, ended that's not, up where, but, yeah. but that's not how and he, he measured it. Do you think that's how he measured it? Do you think he ended up telling the story mm -hmm. in the end? Oh, yes. No, I do. Okay. I mean, I... Because I, a lot I, of people said it, it worked for two-thirds of the way in, uh -huh. and then it didn't. Yeah, but you know what? It's funny, though, because I think at the time, you know, with the whole big build-up and everything, yeah, the whole Marlon Brando sequence is my least favorite sequence yeah, of that right. movie. All right. But is it a failure? No. Okay. All right. De Palma and Bonfire the Vanities. Okay, now, the th well, I mean, uh, yeah, well, the thing is, it's really funny. I'm not suggesting these people no. have lost their talent. No, but no, is no, that no, 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 I know you're not. I'm looking for an not. example of the kind of thing that might fit. Okay, the thing is, in the case of Bonfire of the Vanities, is the fact that, uh, uh, actually, I go back to Pauline Kael, because yeah. uh, she actually said like, something perfect with Bonfire of the Vanities in particular. She says, the thing that's so crazy about Bonfire of the Vanities is De Palma had made Bonfire of the Vanities better than anybody ever could back in 1969 when he did the movie High Mom with yeah. Robert De Niro. Yeah. All right, this little like you know hippie kind of movie he did that hit on even better than 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 uh, uh, Thomas Wolfe's book exactly what he was talking about in that movie. So he didn't need to remake it. He didn't need to make it anymore. Yeah. Now, but the thing is also again going back to something Pauline Kael said about other filmmakers is Bonfire of the Vanities is a mess. But it's the kind of mess that only a great filmmaker makes. Hacks never go that far wrong. <laughs> it's like a very talented guy who's just got the it wrong idea. It has to be idea. a genius who lost it. Yeah. Oh, it's, yeah. It's, it's, or who went too far because he so believed in himself and he had the confidence. Yeah. It's more like it's just like he had a bunch of bad ideas and had the, the, the talent the of his and the, and the truth of conviction of his bad ideas in that yeah. movie. All right. Um, and I don't think he's. I don't think he's. I don't think he's lost it. I think he. Felt it hard. I know he did. I think, he told me. Yeah, I think he. I think he took it really hard, and he's been playing scrambling ever since. Right. All right, but scrambling to find his footing again, which yes, scrambling to find his footing again because which I think conv which, is it confidence? No, I don't know if it's confidence. I think it's more like the fact that okay, uh, I reached out with Bond. Well, he reached out with Casualties of War, right. and even though the film wasn't a, a success, got the best reviews of his entire career. Right. All right, so it's like you know, so he'd reached out before, but then and then so he reached out even more with Bonfire and it didn't work. And I think you see, when you look at the films he's been doing since, in like in the case of uh, uh, um, uh, Raising Cain, right. All right, he goes, okay, I'm going to go back and do what I do, all right, what, my thrillers, all right, and that'll be, that'll be a cool ground, all right. And the thing that's really fascinating about Raising Cain is you see a guy, and I, and I, and I told this to him and he agreed with me. Uh, I don't know, I thought Raising Cain was a, was a blast. I had a total blast out of watching it, but part of the fun about the movie, which I don't, you know, I don't know if the studio liked it that much, was the fact that it's almost, the whole thing works to annoy the viewer. Because it's like, you've got a man who like, look, I created more or less in these last 20 years this type of film, all right? And, um, and I do it better than anybody, but you know what? I'm bored with doing it now. All right, so the only way I can make it interesting for me is to completely di dissect it and not pay you off. Yeah. You know, so it became like this, like really almost kind of like filmic experiment on how not to satisfy the audience. Yeah. All right, which was very interesting to me. Okay, I got a big kick out of it. If you had to name, I mean, I, I know you don't want to leave somebody out. Who's influenced you the most, filmmakers? You said Howard Hawks. Yeah, Howard Hawks is a gigantic influence. Because? Uh, oh, well, he is the single, as far as, for, for my money, he is the single greatest storyteller, all right, in the history of cinema. The single greatest storyteller. Yeah, he, and, and, and probably the single most entertaining filmmaker in the history of cinema. It's, it's so funny because when you get into um, uh, uh, this, I mean, when you're talking about people who've like, you know, worked for 30 years and have like, you know, 25, 30, 40 films to show for it, um, you know, the old guys, the pioneers. Yeah. All right, when you go through their films and everything like that, you know, you're, you're looking at this film and, and like, you know, oh, I, I never saw this one, and I never saw this one that I really want to. And then, like, um, you start seeing some of their later works or some, like, early minor work yeah. that you did, always heard about but never saw it. You always are more or less kind of disappointed. It's like, you know, that's okay. Yeah. It's good to see it so I can say I saw it and everything. Howard Hawks, except for one movie, never disappointed me. All right? It's like, you know, it's like even like his, you know, even the ones that didn't get any credit whatsoever, like the ones he did later in his life, like something like, like, like Man's Favorite Sport, which is just basically this, like, kind of crazy paraphrased remake of Bringing a Baby, is funny. Is it good to bring a baby? No, but it's like really good. It's it's really funny. Now, if I'm gonna watch bringing a baby or man's favorite sport, I'll watch 
bringing a baby. But if man's favorite sport's on TV, I'll watch it in two seconds. If it's yeah. playing at the theaters, I'll go see it. Other than how, okay, Howard Hawks, who else? A significant influence. A big significant influence, okay, would be uh, like Howard Hawks, uh, uh, the director Sam Fuller, all right, uh, uh, who's just like kind of, just one, he's one of the greatest wild men of cinema. He made a, a series of films in the 50s. Uh, he, uh, he's, he's, probably the, he's probably the king of making war films because he, he fought in the Big Red One and everything. Yeah. And, and he, he makes really crazy movies. And he also made a lot of westerns and stuff. And um, Sam Fuller's just crazy style was a big influence to me. De Palma was a big influence to me. And one of the things about De Palma that people never talk about, and I, I think De Palma is probably the greatest uh, um, black uh, satirist of the last 20 years in cinema. I mean, his films are, are, are hysterical, biting black comedies. I mean, I mean, you know, no one has his wit at all, you know, great. His wit is just fantastic, uh, even though he never makes official comedies. Um, but like, uh, 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 you know, Scorsese's just daring. Yeah. You know, has always been a big influence to me. I usually never... His daring. Yeah. I usually never accredit him because everyone, <laughs> everyone does it for me yeah, anyway. Right. I always say, well, he's obviously ripping off. Yeah, exactly. Well, I don't say ripping <laughs> off, but they do say influenced by De Palma and Scorsese. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, Sergio Leone was a big influence Because of the me. spaghetti westerns? Oh, definitely because of the spaghetti westerns. And also because of, like, one, he actually, you know, he was, like, the first, like, like you know, director where I, where I, when I started, like, really thinking about becoming a filmmaker where I was like... Wow, I mean, well, that's a director. That's that's a film that's directed. That's a directed. director because well, his films are so stylized. They're yeah, so right, they're. Right, I mean, right. they they are so directed. I mean, yeah. that it's. I mean, you it's, could watch that film and you knew who made it. Yes, exactly. And you could even like watch the whole filmmaking process. You know, I mean, uh, I, if you're thinking along those lines, if you're just trying to watch an entertaining story, mm. it's mm. there. All right. Um, but uh, and then also uh, a major influence uh, was uh, uh, Jean Luc Godard has like uh, influenced me quite a bit. It comes European art film. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, basically because his, uh, his inventiveness and his like breaking the rules and commenting on cinema while you're watching cinema. Yeah. You know, phony process shots in the background and stuff like that. The other thing also is uh, there's a French director named Jean-Pierre Melville who came out in the 50s and basically started doing a whole series of, and he was like a total like entertainment director he did a whole series of, uh, of crime films always like set in Paris or Marseille or something um, that were basically the Warner Brothers Bogart Cagney films all right but completely set to this like French Parisian rhythm and they started like Delon Delon or Jean-Paul yeah, right, 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 you know right, right. and they're great and they work very much in the same way that like Sergio Leone's films do where they take a genre that like, we know left, right, forwards, up and down and backwards, yeah. all right? But, they've, but they do it with a whole different style and a whole different perspective. And here they've basically reinvented the genre. They've created something new that didn't exist before. Now, that's what I'm always kind of trying to do with my genre films. I don't know if I'm succeeding or not, but that's the attempt. To? To take something you've seen before, I love it. I respect it, and I'm going to deliver the goods. I'm not just yeah. going to be some arty guy going off, you know, uh, right. but I'm, I'm, I'm delivering the goods. But I'm also trying to, you know, reinvent it in a way. All right, do something, you know, do it in a much different way you've ever seen before. Like in the case of Reservoir Dogs. And again, it's not trying to just be a clever boy. It's not just a clever right, idea. Right. It's got to work dramatically. All right, but like, you know, do a heist film. Deliver the goods as a heist film, but it's a heist film where you never see the heist. That's just my goofy way of doing it. <laughs> you know, I always say, like, if I was going to do, like, you know, a hunchback movie, the guy would get, like, have an operation at the beginning of the film. <laughs> the guy used to be the hunchback in Notre Dame. How <laughs> much credit to, to Harvey Cattell Reservoir Dogs? Did he have something to do with that being made? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's funny because, like, that's one of those things that's, like, it hasn't been blown out of proportion, but, like, you know, there were, like, you know, three people that were very, very instrumental, uh, four people that were very instrumental in getting it made, and Harvey's one of the four, but... Harvey's the one that always got the credit for it. You know, right. uh, uh, my partner Lawrence Bender deserves a tremendous right. amount of producer. credit for it. He's a producer of the film. Uh, Monty Hellman, who a wonderful filmmaker right. from the '60s, who who helped us with the film. He deserves a lot of credit, and so does uh, uh, the, one of the executive producers on the film, Richard Gladstein, who was the guy at the company at Live Entertainment that like said, "I'm going to take a chance on this kid." You know, yeah. I really owe my career to him. And well, he took a chance on you because of what the he... Script. Because the, of script. the script. Because, because of, of the that script. script. Because of that script. Now, had he seen the same thing in True Romance and... He had never read True Romance. 